Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Pocahontas was a Native American woman notable for her association with the colonial settlement at Jamestown. She was the daughter of the paramount chief of a network of tributary tribes encompassing the Tidewater region of Virginia. In 1608, she befriended the daring English explorer and adventurer John Smith, and later converted to Christianity and was baptized under the name Rebecca. She married the Virginia tobacco planter John Rolfe in 1614 and bore their son. Pocahontas has entered the pantheon of modern popular culture and is a subject of art, literature, and film. Numerous places, landmarks, and products in the United States have been named after Pocahontas. Her story has been romanticized over the years, many aspects of which are fictional, with the most famous being the many celebrated stories told about her and John Smith. The Thrilling Adventure of Captain John Smith For those who love stories of the Indians and the strange and perilous adventures of white men in dealing with the forest tribes, we cannot do better than give a remarkable anecdote of life in the Virginia woodlands centuries ago. On a day near the opening of the winter of 1608, it was evident the Indians knew the value of their prisoner and recognized that they had in their hands the great chief of the Pale Faces, Captain John Smith. In fact, the Chickahominy chief felt that his captive was of too much importance to be dealt with hastily, and was taking him to the village of the great chief Powhatan, who ruled like an emperor over a powerful confederation of tribes. In summer, his residence was near the falls of the James River, but he was in the habit of spending the winter on the banks of York River, his purpose being to enjoy the fish and oysters of the neighboring Chesapeake. Wezuwakamoka was the name of this winter residence, and here the captive was at length brought after the long woodland journey. Captain Smith had met the old Indian emperor before, at his summer home on the James River, near where the city of Richmond now stands. But that was as a freeman, with his guard around him and his hands unbound. Now he was brought before him as a captive, subject to his royal will or caprice. He found the famous lord of the tribes in his large wigwam with his wives around him and his vigilant guard of warriors grouped on the greensward outside, where the Indian lodges stretched in a considerable village along the stream. Powhatan wore a large robe made of raccoon skins. A rich plume of feathers ornamented his head and a string of beads pended from his neck. At his head and feet sat two young Indian girls, his favorite wives, wearing richly adorned dresses of fur, with plumes in their hair and necklaces of pearls. Other women were in the room, and a number of the leading warriors who sat around gave the fierce war-cry of the tribe as the captive was brought in. The old chieftain looked with keen eyes on his famous prisoner, of whose capture he had been advised by runners sent before. There was a look of triumph and malignity in his eyes, but Captain Smith stood before him unmoved. He had been through too many dangers to be easily dismayed, and near death's door too often to yield to despair. Powhatan gave an order to a young Indian woman, who brought him a wooden basin of water, that he might wash his hands. Then she presented him a bunch of feathers to serve as a towel. This done, meat and cornbread were placed before him. As he ate, Powhatan talked with his warriors, consulting with them, the captain feared, upon his fate. But he finished his meal with little loss of appetite, trusting to the providence which had saved him more than once before, to come to his aid again. As he ate, his vigilant eyes looked heedfully around the room. Many who were there gazed on him with interest, and one of them, a young Indian girl of twelve or thirteen years of age, with pity and concern. It was evident that she was of high rank in the tribe, for she was richly dressed and wore in her hair a plume of feathers like that of Powhatan, and on her feet moccasins embroidered like his. There was a troubled and compassionate look in her eyes, as she gazed on the captive white man, a look which he may perhaps have seen and taken comfort from in his hour of dread. No such feeling as this seemed to rest in the heart of the old chief and his warriors. Their conference quickly ended, and though its words were strange to him, the captive could read his fate in their dark and frowning faces. They had grown to hate the whites, and now that their leader was a captive before them, they decided to put him to death. There was no loss of time in preparation for the execution of the fatal decree. At an order from Powhatan, the captive was seized and securely bound. Then he was laid on the floor of the hut, with his head on a large stone brought in from outside. Beside him stood a stalwart Indian grasping a huge war-club. A word, a signal from Powhatan, was alone needed, and the victim's brains would have been dashed out. 
At this critical moment, Smith's good angel watched over him. A low cry of pity was heard, and the young girl who had watched him with such concern sprang forward and clasped her arms about the poor prisoner, looking up at the Indian emperor with beseeching eyes. It was Pocahontas, his favorite daughter. Her looks touched the old man's heart, and he bade the executioner to stand back, and gave orders that the captives should be released. Powhatan soon showed that he was in earnest in his act of mercy. He treated the prisoner in a friendly fashion, and two days later set him free to return to Jamestown. All that he asked in return was that the whites should send him two of their great guns and a grindstone. Smith readily consented, no doubt with a secret sense of amusement, and set out for the settlement led by Indian guides. Raw Hunt, a favorite servant of Powhatan, was one of the guides, and on reaching Jamestown Smith showed him two cannon and a grindstone, and bade him carry them home to his master. Raw Hunt tried, but when he found that he could not stir one of the weighty presents from the ground, he was quite content to take back less bulky presents in their place. So runs the story of Captain Smith's remarkable adventure. No doubt it is well to say here that there are writers who doubt the whole story of Pocahontas and her deed of mercy, simply because Captain Smith did not speak of it in his first book. But there is no very good reason to doubt it, and we know that things like this happened in other cases. Thus, in the story of De Soto, Juan Hortiz, the Spanish captive, was saved from being burned alive by an Indian maiden in much the same way. Pocahontas, after that, was always a friend of the English, and often visited them in Jamestown. Once she stole away through the woods and told her English friends that Powhatan and his warriors were going to attack them. Then she stole back again. When the Indians came, they found the English ready, and concluded to defer their attack. Later, after she had grown up, she was taken prisoner and held in Jamestown as a hostage to make her father quit threatening the English. While there, a young planter named John Rolfe fell deeply in love with her, and she loved him warmly in return. In the end, Pocahontas became a Christian and was baptized at Jamestown under the name of Rebecca. Then she and John Rolfe were married and went to live in England, where she was known as the Lady Rebecca and treated as if she were indeed a princess. She met John Smith once more, and was full of joy at sight of her father, as she called him. But when he told her that she must not call him that, and spoke to her very respectfully as Lady Rebecca, she covered her face with her hands and began to weep. She had always called him father, she said, and he had called her child, and she meant to do so still. They had told her he was dead, and she was very glad to learn that this was false, for she loved him as a father, and would always do so. That was her last meeting with Captain Smith. In less than a year afterward, she was taken sick and died, just as she was about to return to her beloved Virginia. John Smith is the author of his own story, and there is no source of Pocahontas's own writing or words. What we know about her has been passed down through oral histories or recorded by the English, who were far from neutral. But we do know that Pocahontas wasn't even her real name. Her name was Matoaka, she hid that name, believing it would bring her harm to share it. Once she was baptized, they said, OK, now you can know her native name, her real name, because it apparently no longer had any power. Although it's not like Pocahontas ever had very much power among the English. Of course, in the Disney version, it's not mentioned that her father had moved her to another village in the Confederacy far away from Jamestown. Many historians believe that Pocahontas was also married and possibly had a child. During that first Anglo-Powhatan War, someone from Jamestown had the idea to kidnap Pocahontas and use her as a bargaining chip. But then they decided not to let her go. To the English, she was more useful as an agent for their own interests. The reference has always been the piece of Pocahontas, but that is because she was an ambassador after being kidnapped and taken away from her husband and child. In 1614, Pocahontas got remarried, this time to an Englishman named John Rolfe. Her name became Rebecca Rolfe. She converted to Christianity, sailed to England, met the queen, had a son. She died in her early 20s. England, the final resting place of Rebecca Rolfe. How is she addressed in her grave? It says Rebecca Rolfe, but it also has Pocahontas in there. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs> 